You aren't going to believe what I found in a flea market in Florida. Trust me, this one's going to be one to watch. Hey, folks, it's Doug. And boy, do I have a couple pickup stories for you today. Uh, as I mentioned in the teaser, we went to beautiful Daytona Beach uh, in the surrounding areas. There's actually a number of really amazing spots to go video game hunting. And we're going to talk today about one in particular you probably have never heard of and perhaps never thought to look for a store here. I'm talking about the Daytona Beach Flea Market. Now, that's right. I know some people will stop me right there and say, hey, wait a minute. There's not really a lot of good finds you traditionally find in a flea market. And for the most part, I tend to agree with you, right? You're usually thinking the stereotypes of sun-faded common games, sports games, and overpriced games. But here's the thing. There is a hidden gem. So in the Daytona Beach flea market, there is your typical layout of aisles of boots, uh, outdoors, like, you know, inside kind of like a shed area that's not necessarily temperature controlled. So it's, it's the kind of thing where, you know, you get hot and stuffy pretty quickly. But in the back of the flea market area, there's a little area of shops that are actually enclosed in a, in a proper building climate controlled ac all that good stuff and in that building there is a store it's called the video game dungeon and let me tell you if you've ever been in the uh, daytona area if you travel there if you live there and you've gone game hunting and you haven't gone to the video game dungeon yet oh you're in for a treat uh the owner runs the store the way i think video game stores should be run in particular two elements of it that i think are really important these days in making a great video game store number one selection you you go in to this shop and you forget that you're at a flea market and you're kind of blown away because this is the opposite of your stereotypical flea market video game store. Oh my goodness, are there um, amazing items, uh, hard to find things everywhere for all sorts of platforms from 8-bit consoles all the way up to modern consoles, uh, obscure things, hard to find, uh, classics, uh, high-end stuff, uh, you name it, soup to nuts. I mean, if you can't find it here, it's probably pretty tough to find. And number two, um, there is a lot of very uh, well-curated, high-quality merchandise there. You know, it's one thing to find a game that's kind of obscure or low print or one you've been looking for forever, and then you ask to look at it, and it looks like it's been run over by a tank. Um, there is a lot of really really good condition games. Uh, we're talking complete in box things. Even the loose things have good labels. So that begs the question, all right, Doug, we get it. It's a cool place. It's a it's a hidden gem. Well, what did you find there? The first, uh, which just was amazing to see in person, was the Tengen version of Tetris complete in box. So here's the backstory, uh, in case you were wondering, about Tengen Tetris and why it's so special. Uh, it is a cartridge, a game steeped in infamy. Uh, you see, here's the deal. Tengen, which is a studio of Atari, felt that it had secured the appropriate rights to license the game Tetris, which of course is actually a game uh, invented, developed in Russia. Uh, Atari was under the impression that they had talked to the right people, both domestically and in Russia, to license the rights to Tetris. Meanwhile, the good folks at Nintendo had gone through some different channels and believed that they actually had the right to the license for Tetris, not just for the Nintendo Entertainment System, but also the rights to use it as the pack-in game for the OG Game Boy. Uh, suffice it to say, there were differences of opinion on said legality. Uh, Russian government agency that uh, purports to oversee uh, such licensing uh, was a little miffed about the situation. And a uh, long story short, Atari, feeling they had a better claim than Nintendo did, sued Nintendo. Nintendo countersued, and there was a whole bunch of butthurt in court. Long story short, the judge said, 
Oh my god, this is a dumpster fire. You know what? Screw you, Atari. You don't have the rights to Tetris. Oh, you've already manufactured a half million cartridges? Well, too bad, so sad. Recall them all and destroy them immediately. Now, Atari Tengen had sold roughly 100,000 to 125,000 copies uh, before this order came down, depending on who you talk to. So while this isn't exactly uh, the smallest print run game in the NES library, it's not exactly prolific and easy to find either uh so you know this is this one is tough to get particularly complete in the box so it was amazing when as soon as i stared my beady little eyes into the glass case in the front of the store with the uh high higher value nes stuff there it was right in front of me a boxed tension tetris and i gotta tell you the tension we'll call it the tension cardboard right the cardboard stock that Tengen uses uh, for its for its games was, in my opinion, of a much lower quality than the cardboard stock that we'll say authorized uh, Nintendo games used, and so it is very difficult to find any of those Tengen games complete in box in outstanding physical condition. And while this one was not perfect, let me be clear, this was for Tengen cardboard an extremely high quality example of this game and it had the book it had the cartridge there was actually a receipt from a video game store or video store uh that sold this game to a consumer apparently after the recall came down Ooh, interesting i i hope the statute of limitations is up uh, i hope that the russian police don't come after me i probably shouldn't have even said anything about that unfortunately didn't have the promotional poster but that's you know, something that's even a, a bigger holy grail, and someday I'm sure I'll find one. Uh, but this was an amazing example of this game complete in box. And again, if you're hunting this in the wild, you're just never going to see it. Like, it's going to be incredibly rare. So I couldn't help myself. Uh, I paid up for it. You know, I paid about about price charting for that game, uh, which is another thing that's interesting, right? And it reinforces a point I've made before. Uh, price charting values are useful. But I think it's important to note that price charting, a price charting value for, say, any given complete in box NES game doesn't take, in my humble opinion, one of the most important factors in pricing into consideration, and that is condition. See, here's the thing. I was happy to pay price charting for the complete in box NES Tengen Tetris here because the price and the sold comparables that they're using to establish that price are all over the board condition wise. I did take a quick look through that uh, before I committed to the purchase. And, you know, three or four of the most recent solds that they were referencing were in pretty poor condition, of uh, those complete in box examples. So in my opinion, even though I, you know, didn't negotiate down a, a, a significant haircut from price charting, I actually felt like I got a pretty good deal because of the condition of the game. And this is the kind of game that's going to continue to be worth more and more as people try to put sets together and realize, there's not many good examples floating around, so I'm very happy. I'm certainly not selling this game. I'm not investing in it. It's going on my shelf. Uh, this was just a great price for a great game. Uh, so the second game that I purchased was Gremlins 2, which is another one of those games that you don't see a whole lot of those out there in general, much less complete in box. And boy, if the Tengen Tetris was in good condition, let me tell you something. This had to be the finest condition Gremlins 2 I've ever laid my eyes on. Again, and I've been doing this stuff for decades. I've seen pretty much every game in the NES library uh, at least one time or another, be it a convention, an estate sale, a yard sale, you name it. And again, like I said before, it was priced right at price charting, but I feel like that was an excellent deal for me because you're just not going to find this game complete in the condition I found it. You might go a whole career of collecting and not see it. So I was more than happy to pay up, and I considered it extremely fair uh, to get this game. Uh, so what is Gremlins 2, by the way? Well, Gremlins 2 was made by Sunsoft, released in 1990 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. And I've seen a lot of reviews of this game online, but I got to tell you, having played it uh, and experienced it, 
I, w- I would suggest that Gremlins 2 uh, clearly came from the same development team at Sunsoft that made some previous Sunsoft games. I'm specifically thinking of Blaster Master and Fester's Quest, the Adams Family-themed game. So just imagine if Blaster Master and Fester's Quest uh, hooked up in a speed dating event for NES cartridges, got busy, and decided to uh, name their kid Gremlins 2. That would be Gremlins 2 for the NES in terms of art style, music, general play mechanics and feel. So uh, in fairness, both Blaster Master and Fester's Quest are solid games. So that should tell you something right there. I consider it... um, A game that few people know about. Again, it didn't get a very good print run, uh, but it's kind of, again, a hidden gem itself in the NES library. And I would suggest that if you're looking for something to try, uh, some new games to try on the NES, uh, give Gremlins 2 a shot. It's a pretty solid title. I'll give you one little bonus story here. Uh, Another game that was purchased was uh, the Game Boy, a loose cartridge for Game Boy, called uh, Adventures of Blobette, which was actually a spiritual sequel to the NES game A Boy and His Blob. So why was that meaningful to me? What has a special a special place for me? Um, a couple of years ago, when we started uh, you know, creating content on YouTube, uh, my producer and my spouse, Cassandra Hammerstone, told me that she loved this game. Uh, she had it when she was a little kid uh, with her Game Boy. It was her favorite game on Game Boy. She didn't have the game anymore. Anymore. Um, and I wanted to do something really special. I went and I searched and I and I paid a pretty penny, but happy to do so. And I found a complete box copy uh, on the Game Boy of the Adventures of Blobette. And it was in such good condition. Uh, and I gave it to her as her gift. And she thought it was beautiful and amazing. Uh, and, and we found it was in such good condition. We decided to protect it by getting it graded. Not because we wanted to sell it, but we wanted to preserve it. it was, it's a nice shelf piece. Uh, but we realized shortly after we did that that now she doesn't have a playable copy anymore. She has a Game Boy, uh, but wanted a copy to play. So for the last three years or so, I have been searching high and low for any player's loose copy of Adventures of Blobbat. We're talking about dozens of conventions, hundreds of video game stores, countless you know yard sales, estate sales, flea markets, you name it, uh, local Facebook, and I have never found one until I walked in to the video game dungeon. And, you know, after perusing the stuff that I was going to be interested in purchasing on the NES stuff, went over to the far end of the store in the case where I could see there was handheld stuff, looked down at the Game Boy selection, and boom, there it was. And I was just gobsmacked. Like, if that isn't a testament to the epic selection that this store has. I don't know what is. That wasn't exactly a game they made a ton of, folks. That's one of the hardest games to find regardless in the original OG Game Boy library. Uh, This was one of only two forays into game development that legendary game programmer David Crane, who most know from Pitfall and Pitfall 2 for the Atari 2600, uh, one of the founding fathers, if you will, of Activision, uh, one of his only four in the game by programming. The game is also known to be difficult is... It, it, it was likely really rushed. It was likely faced with the same developmental challenges as the NES version A Boy in His Blob, which it has been documented that David Crane only was given a matter of weeks to design and develop said game. Now, granted, I'm sure he's familiar with that kind of crazy cutthroat scheduling from his days with Atari and Activision, but nonetheless, uh, that is a common criticism between A Boy in His Blob and Blobette, games that you probably could have been legendary if they just had a little more time in the proverbial oven. But nonetheless, again, really noteworthy titles, super hard to find, and actually, despite the uh, very shortened development cycle, still a lot of fun to play. So, long story short, uh, our visit to the video game dungeon recently was incredible, fun, uh, interesting. We got a lot of stuff. Uh, I spent money, but it was money well spent. It was quality product. Uh, and I got to tell you, again, if you are in the area, whether you live there, you plan on visiting there, and you like you some game hunting, uh, be advised that you definitely want to hit up the Daytona Beach Flea Market. I promise you, you will not be 
disappointed. And with that, we come to the end of yet another episode. Uh, I hope you enjoy this sort of stuff. I plan on doing some more uh, pickup videos from our f recent Florida sojourn, so please look forward to that. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Uh, do you like how we do these? Uh, do you have any suggestions, thoughts, games you'd like to see me look for specifically, places you'd like to see me go to hunt? We're willing to travel, folks. Um, looking to take all those suggestions in. Well, again, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time on It's All Doug and Game. Games.